So hello, I'm Caroline. I'm very happy to be with you this morning. Um, we're going to discuss the tight relationships between data, cities, and citizens. So uh, I began working as a data journalist. Uh, I'm now doing data visualization at DataVise. And so DataVise, we are a small studio specialized in human data interactions. We have been designing and crafting data visualization for 10 years now. And for the next 10 years, uh, we have decided to focus on mobility and urban planning issues. We want to create visual simulators to help citizens, to help decision makers better understand our complex uh, urban systems. So that was uh, just to make the introduction. And the main question, how we put data in the hands of citizens. It's a fascinating question. It's one of the reasons why, why I co-founded DataVise, because data, it's, it's complicated, it's abstract, it's technical, uh, and it requires some skills. So for citizens, it's often, it's like a black box. Uh, data, it's the language made for machines, not for humans. So how do you ensure this data, this, this raw material, is useful and is used to improve the way we understand a complex environment. There are plenty of ways to make these links between data and citizens. And for example, uh, Google Maps or Airbnb, Spotify, they all use data to offer a service to citizens. So they all make a mediation between citizens and data. Uh, it's the, the whole digital economy is based on this. Uh, but in this case, citizens, they are in a very passive situation. They have the role of consumers. So can we really say it's putting data at the service of citizens? So I, I won't discuss this question today. Uh, I'd like to dig deeper. And dig deeper, it's open data. This is another way to create a link between data and citizens. And this is this way I would like to discuss today. The ambition of open data is to free up data so it can be reused by citizens. Uh, it can be private data, like corporate data, or it can be public data. It can be cities data, for example. So here we are, citizens, cities, data, three objects, a, multiple, uh, a multitude of connection and possible scenarios. We will explore together four connection patterns, uh, and these connection patterns, it should trace our 10 years in this field. First pattern, data platforms. What was in the mind of the founders of the open data movement? Maybe the best is to listen to one of the pioneers, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, so one of the founding fathers of the web. Uh, here is an extract from his um, um, a talk, The Next Web, in, uh, in uh, 2009. So it is with data. I could talk about all kinds of data. We could talk about government data. Enterprise data is really uh, important. There's scientific data. There's personal data. There's weather data. There's data about events. There's data about talks, and there's news, and there's all kinds of stuff. I'm just going to mention a few of them so that you get the idea of the diversity of it, so that you also see how much unlocked potential. Let's start with government data. Barack Obama said in a speech, that he, well, the American government data would be available on, on the internet in accessible formats. And I hope that they will put it up as linked data. That's important. Why is it important? Not just for transparency. Yeah, transparency of government is important. But that data, this is the data from all the government departments. Think about how much of that data is about how life is lived in America. It's actually useful. It's got value. I can use it in my company. I could use it as a kid to do my homework. So we're talking about making the place, making the world run better by making this data available. In fact, if you're responsible, if you know about some data in government department, often you find that these people, they're very tempted to keep it, to uh, Hans calls it database hugging. You, you, you hug your database, you don't want to let it go until you've made a beautiful website for it. Well, I'd like to suggest that rather before you, yes, make a beautiful website. Who am I to say don't make a beautiful website? Make a beautiful website, but First, give us the unadulterated data. We want the data. We want unadulterated data. OK, we have to ask for raw data now. And I'm going to ask you to practice that, OK? Can you say raw? raw. Can you say data? Can you say now? Right. Raw data now. Raw. 
practice that. It's important because you have no idea the number of excuses people come up with to hang on to their data and not give it to you, even though you've paid for it as a taxpayer. And it's not just America, it's all over the world. And it's not just governments, of course, it's enterprises as well. Yeah, that's quite moving for me because I started to work in this field. There is no open data. And this was really the shout. It's, it's uh, yeah. Quite moving, but what should we do? What should we take away? He asked for all data to be opened. Everything that can be open must be open. We will see later if we use it or not. Uh, open data is request above all for economic uh, interest, a bit for controlling the administration, but economic interest first. And access to raw data is more important than anything else. You will see later for communicating the open data for website and so on. So this is the really first movement. And what came out from this first movement? Mainly open data platforms, portals on which uh, public organizations make data sets freely available and usable formats with licenses uh, allowing the reuse. And cities have played a leading role here. Um, in France, for example, the city of Rennes, uh, they launched the first open data portal in France in 2010, a year before the national portal. Uh, in New York City, it was the same. The open data initiatives were in place before the national portal. Um, so the city, they played this leading role because the data sets that were open at the beginning, they were often data sets about everyday things, like, for example, uh, public transport timetables, uh, car registration, or public toilets, the street furniture, uh, real estate, things like that. What was done with this data? There have been a lot of citizen reuse, many concern local initiatives, uh, focus on local life, and one of the best examples is this website, Every Block. Uh, it has been created by Adrian Olovati, um, and it's kind of local news website, but it's made with open data sets. So it included, it included uh, among other things, like uh, crime data, aggregated crime data, but also uh, fire alerts, everything about neighborhood events, local sports, and so on. The data visualization, as you can see, it was the beginning at that time of web data visualization, so it, it's quite new, uh, but it has been uh, automatically identified as something necessary to make the open data concrete, to translate the data into something that can be read by uh, citizens. Uh, so it's, it's quite simple, the data visualization at that time. Uh, it was mostly one of experiments from geeky people most part of the time. So in summary, uh, what's the pattern? Citizens, they have the driving role. They are the one who claim the data. They are the one in the best position to reuse the data to do something with it. Cities, they are focused on opening the data. Cities or public institutions. They don't care much about the reuse at the moment. Uh, they care about standardized formats and uh, being the most, the most natural, opening the data in the most natural way possible. Citizen, citizens are the users of the data. Uh, they create applications centered on local life, and ultimately, this is how this data benefits to citizens. So this is the first pattern. Now, second pattern, open data politics. What happened? The first limit, th there have been few criticism to this uh, opening open data movement, the first one. First limitation, the cost of opening data. For Public organization, they are full of data. There are data everywhere in public organization. For example, uh, deputy expense, uh, all the books borrowed at a library, uh, all the trays in the street, uh, the baby's name from uh, the last year. Uh, there are data everywhere. You can open a lot of things. But it has a cost to clean these files, to format them, to standardize the format, to make them available online. So opening all the available data, even the one no one cares about, um, it can seem like a huge effort in terms of uh, time and, and money. So some rationalization has taken over. Some cities now try to better identify what citizens may need or what can be of economic interest and focus on opening those data sets only uh, rather than op trying to open everything. So that means that uh, open data has become a public policy, a pub politics, where uh, public organizations now choose what they want to open, they choose their priorities, they choose the fields of action, and they open the data set uh, that match those uh, priorities. Uh, so open data is now a lever 
to encourage certain sectors of the economy, to encourage certain sectors of innovation. The second limit, it's about uh, public of reuses, because um, who is really able to reuse data, uh, to understand it, to exploit it, to make application? It's, it's not everyone. It's uh, mainly developers, entrepreneurs. So open data has been criticized because it helps only the citizens who are already well resourced. It's uh, like empowering the already empower, empowered. So open data was not really for everyone. That's why um, data visualization begins to play a larger role at that moment. Some cities and organizations, um, they wanted to reach out a wider audience, uh, they wanted their, their open data portal be useful for more citizens, and they wanted to be sure everyone can understand the, the data. So they added data visualization and the data portals. Uh, here you can see the OECD data portal uh, 10 years ago. Um, it's a snapshot from a long time ago. Um, also, there is the London Open Data Portal. They are both using data visualization to address citizens. It's quite simple data visualization, as you can see, but it allows information to be read without having to download a file, to open a data set, to read the data set, and so on. So it was important. And some cities wanted to go further. Uh, they wanted to use data to animate communities of citizens. They wanted really to create a mediation with the population thanks to the data, uh, the open data, and thanks to data visualization. It was exactly the case for Rennes, Rennes Metropolis. We have been uh, working with them in 2012. So it was <laughs> mainly 10 years ago, about 10 years ago. Uh, it's a very old project. Um, they asked us uh, to create a data visualization that portrays the population, the inhabitants, using open data. The open data they just uh, released at that moment. So the goal was to prove that data are not just for developers or entrepreneurs, it's for everyone, and it can help people better understand where they live, better understand uh, the neighborhoods. So just to have a, a quick look at this very old project, um, it's, it was the map of uh, the metropolis. It's a, a map of the metropolis. On this map, uh, the population is represented by small dots, and you can uh, filter the population you want to see. The idea is the inhabitants that are like me, uh, who are they, uh, where are they in the, in the community, and so on. So uh, you can filter uh, the population by age and by gender. You can also uh, understand better uh, what's this population how it's made, for example, what's uh, the birthplace, the profession, and so on. So everything is uh, made with the small bubbles that does represent the population and that make it playful. Because something we discovered is that for people, uh, data is abstract. So if you want the general public to get interested about data, it, it should be something that they, they know it behaves like the normal, um, uh, it's, it behaves like something they know, like uh, some bubbles, some... Uh, some, some small part of, uh, of uh, material. So, in summary, what's the pattern for this second pattern? Cities, they provide the data. They choose which data set they want to open and they provide the data. Citizens, they are always the one responsible for reusing the data, uh, even if cities encourage the citizens by popularizing some data sets and animating communities, but it's always citizens that are the reusers, and by reusing the data, uh, these data benefit the citizens. So, simpler pattern for this second pattern. Third pattern now, open smart cities. We can make another criticism of this uh, second pattern. The city is involved but the, with the popularization efforts, but citizens are still expected to reuse the data, to do something interesting with it. Um, if uh, it's not citizen, we are expecting that developers, entrepreneurs, innovators are reusing the data, but it's always civil society um, that will be transforming this data into something useful in terms of uh, social and economic innovation. Um, but it's never the city itself that is reusing the data. If uh, we can take the case of public transport, for example, there has been a huge effort made uh, over the past few years to open data about public transport offers. Uh, it's uh, theoretical data, for example, all the lines of uh, subway, bus, tram, and so on, and uh, the timetables. It's also real-time offers. Um, 
delays in real time, position of the buses in real time. So this, this is now quite often open. Open data policies, uh, they have Lots of cities and governments have encouraged the developers of applications that promotes multimodality. So the all the applications where that helps you find your way with uh, combining train, buses, uh, self-service uh, bikes, uh, carpooling. All of those applications have been developed by so, uh, civil entrepreneurs or by developers or by uh, just a, a private companies. And there is an important challenge. That's why they have been encouraged, because uh, we need to reduce the share of the car in transport, we need to reduce our carbon emission, and we need to reduce the price of transport for uh, users. So it's a huge step forward, those that have been uh, open. It's a huge step forward, those uh, developers of application have been encouraged. But we can question the fact that open data is always addressed to civil society. Citizens are responsible for building their own tool uh, that will improve the situation so they can build some application so that people can consume better the existing transport offer. But open data can also be used to improve the offers rather than just better consuming the offers. Open data can be used to improve the way cities or operators design the transport offers and the way they work on the offer for the citizens. So, this is another way to make the public data at the service of the citizen. It's using the data to better work for citizens. Of course, uh, cities are already using data to work. It's uh, the whole issue of smart cities. It's optimizing the governance of urban networks using data. And we've been talking about smart cities a lot during uh, <laughs> the previous uh, talk. So, more and more, we have sensors, we have video, which provide data in real time to help, city, to help pilot the city. So this smart city application, uh, here again, data visualization is playing an important role because uh, quite often you can find some visual interface with a 3D dashboards that will help render the data. Uh, here you have two examples of those kind of applications. Uh, it has not been created by Datavise, it's made by Actimium and Geodon. Sometimes those kind of uh, interfaces, they are called hypervisors. Uh, so it's dedicated to real-time information, feedback from the city. However, a smart cities, it's really interesting, but uh, smart cities project, it's long project, expensive ones, and sometimes, most part of the times, those projects are very network oriented, not really focused on citizen. So in my opinion, the ability to make decisions with data, to work with data at the service of citizens, it does not rely only on the fact that you have real-time data, you have sensor data. It, can, it, really, it depends on how you use the data. Even if you have only um, uh, theoretical offers from public transport data, you can improve the way you work with it to better serve the citizens. So most importantly, to be truly at the service of the citizens, I think that human must be reintroduced, and not only sensor data. Human must be reintroduced in two ways, in my opinion. The first way is the indicators we are using for decision making. Those indicators, they need to describe the reality of the citizens. They need to talk about the impact for the citizens, because this is how you make decision taking citizens into account. The second way to reintroduce humans is to empower humans to take decisions with data, not only focus on algorithms that will optimize automatically the, um, the city, the networks in the city. Because artificial intelligence, they will not be able to take some very structural choice about your network and about the city you want to live in. It's made, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, it's made to optimize existing network. It's not made to design new scenarios for the network, to imagine some other way it can be. So to design those complex systems, we need decision makers to work with data. It's not like just creativity and imagination. It's really working with the data, but empower humans to take decisions with the data. So working, work, working with the data, it's being able to think with the data, it's being able to imagine scenarios, to test the scenarios, to see how it will behave if I do this or if I do that. So let's take an example, again, with public transport data. This is uh, uh, um, the modality project. It's an internal project we are working on at Datavise at the moment. And modality, 
It's a tool uh, to visualize all the mobility offers on a territory and to diagnose the impact of these mobility offers on citizens. So it's also a tool where you can uh, design different scenarios for the offers and you can modify the lines, modify the timetable and see the impact on the citizens. So let me introduce this uh, quite quickly because uh, we are going to talk about modality during the workshop. So if you want to know more, you can go to the workshop. So we, uh, with modality, at the moment we are working on a case, on a case study for the Paris region, uh, the, all the region around Paris. So here you have the map of Paris. Uh, we try to compare the current situation, so here in 2010, and the situation foreseen in 2030 with some new lines, some new subway lines and new train lines that are under construction at the moment. So we use open data from Ile-de-France Mobilité, which is the uh, authority for public transport in Paris region. And we use also uh, data from Navicia, uh, which is an open source software for passenger information. So how does this tool work? We have the network, so this is really the, the raw material, all the lines uh, for bus, for tram, for subway, for train, uh, all the line, all the station in the city. We have those lines for nowadays, for the current network, and we have those lines for the future, the scenario for 2030. With those uh, raw material, with those networks, we also have all the timetables and yeah, all, everything that dedicated to the, to the offer. With that, we can calculate some indicators that describe how you can access, as a citizen, how you can access the territory if you live in this plot or this plot or this plot. So we divided all the region in small plots, 4,000 um, 4, meters uh, from 4,000 meters. And all this um, uh, information is useful to describe if I live here, with, if I use only public transport network in a, uh, 60 minutes or in 30 minutes or in 90 minutes, where can I go? What can I reach? Uh, what are my chances to find a job uh, if I use public transport only and I don't have a car? How many times uh, should I need to go to the hospital? Can I go to the hospital without a car? Uh, can I go to a cultural place without a car? How many um, uh, touristic sites can I visit without a car? And so on. So we created a different indicators describing the reality for citizens. And uh, with those indicators, we can compare the current scenario in 2000, uh, uh, actu actually, and the, the scenario for 2030. And we can also uh, dig deeper uh, because we, we have um, uh, filters. And with those filters, you can uh, slice the population. You, you can highlight plots uh, with, uh, for example, um, uh, the, um, the um, revenue, the how if people are rich or poor. So you can highlight, for example, the richest plot, the, ri the people with the richest, uh, where the richest people live, uh, is their accessibility to the territory better than the place where the poorest people live? For example, here you have the middle age, uh, where the oldest people live. Can they go to the hospital? Uh, quickly, uh, comparing where the um, youngest people live, and so on. So this is yes, just a short demo of uh, what we are working on at the moment, but we're going to go deeper in the workshop. So in summary, what's the pattern? Um, in this third pattern here, cities take the initiatives. They collect data, they provide data, and they use data to improve the way uh, they work, to improve the governance. So here, data, uh, so yes, data is used to improve the cities, and at the end, uh, this benefit to the citizens, because cities are better, so yes, it benefit to the citizens. So here, the, 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 the difference is cities take the initiative in this new pattern. The fourth pattern, cognitive cities now, because the criticism of this previous pattern is that, as you have seen, citizens are practically out of the pattern. Uh, even if we work with indicators that are citizen-centered, focus on citizen, uh, the citizen, they are only final beneficiaries of everything. They have no active role. So this is the fourth pattern, uh, cognitive city, because in this city, citizen can act as 
producers of data, not only as reusers of the data. The idea is that citizens, everyone, us, we can collect data about our close environment and we can take this opportunity to better understand, better document the world around us. It's like quantified self, um, but for the environment and with a collective dimension. It's really like citizen action. I can collect data uh, to enrich the collective knowledge. To introduce this concept of uh, citizens that are data producers, um, I can quickly tell you about a Data Canvas project. It's a, a project I've chosen among many others. It's a platform for citizen participation. Uh, it promotes the development of uh, low-cost sensors. Uh, they created the do-it-yourself sensor kits uh, to measure pollution, to measure dust, uh, light, sound, uh, humidity, temperature. So you can measure lots of things with their, with their uh, sensor kit. And they also provide a platform for citizens to share their geolocalized uh, measures. So there is an interactive map. You can uh, upload your data. All the data is open. Everyone can use this data to tell the story of its city. And this project really wants to empower citizens to sense their city and to make sense of their city. There are a lot of similar projects. Uh, another interesting one, it's a human project. Um, it's in New York City. In 2018, the, this project invited uh, uh, 10,000 New Yorkers to share some personal data and some personal information to help uh, scientists fight important diseases like um, uh, diabetes or asthma. At DataVise, we also have carried out a project which is part of this trend. Uh, it's called Commute. Uh, and in this, for this project, we recorded sound in the subway. So we had a sound recorder and we take the subway from the beginning of the line to the end of the line or just during a daily commute. And we recorded the sound and we created an application where we visualize the sound we have recorded. The idea is that um, the sound you are exposed to, it's very important because it can affect your health and it can, uh, it can impact your fatigue. Um, but it's something you don't see because you are used to. Every day you take the subway and every day you have this noise and you, you don't pay attention, but it, it can be harmful. So the idea of visualizing this noise, it's to make people better aware, but also to be able to act on it. If I know that this line is uh, noisier than this one, maybe I will change a bit or things like that. So just to show you a bit of commute, uh, in Commute, it's really like an RT project. It's, uh, it's, it's not really uh, something we, which you will manage to f uh, have some very precise information. But we translate the data, the audio data, in two different ways. The first way is data sonification. We create a melody, we upload the audio data, and we create a melody like a song for each trip. Uh, we match the, the noise with the frequencies and the intensity of the sound, and we make like a, like a poetic song with your noise data. So yes, every, everyone can uh, use an audio recorder, do your daily trip and upload your, the record on the platform and you will see the song of your daily commute. Uh, the second way, it's using data visualization. So visualizing the data, you can see here how intense the sound has been. Uh, is, uh, is it more intense at the beginning or at the end of the, of the line? You can compare some line and you can uh, better understand what are the noisiest moments, which routes are less noisy than the others and so on. So, these uh, citizens' projects, they are really promising because they help document the city. It's an, another source of information about the city. So you, we have the data that public authorities are already collecting with the sensor networks and so on. And you have the data that citizens are collecting with their personal sensors or with their, or with their smartphones. And this is where we can move from smart cities to cognitive cities. So this term, cognitive cities, it's... Um, it was not invented by ourselves. Uh, it's, it comes from different articles talking about urban governance. And what we call 
um, cognitive cities are cities that make the most out of these citizens that are an out of machine learning. It's learning cities, cognitive cities. Cities that are able to learn and to capitalize on past experience to improve their governance, to make them better able to adapt to a complex system. So remember, smart cities, it's about uh, data analysis to improve efficiency. And cognitive cities, it's about learning with feedback loops to improve sustainability, resilience. Um, Citizens, they are a key element here in those connective cities because they act as sensors. It's like citizens are a network of sensors. If they share data, they can collect with their, for example, their mobile phone. Um, so citizens, they are source of real-time feedback. And this is really important because this is uh, going to help city be reactive and learn from those data. So to summarize this last pattern, in a connective in a Cognitive city, citizens, cities collect data, provide data, use data as in the smart city. So classic data, open data, sensors data. They use this data to improve their governments and to improve the city. Citizens benefit from those improved city, but also citizens play an active role. They collect their own data, they share the data with the, with the cities, and they can inform the cities this way, but they can also better understand their environment, better understand the city thanks to these um, um, uh, actions. So, quick wrap up. We have seen four stages in the relation between cities, citizens, and data. Four different patterns that illustrate the different views of citizens' roles and the different views of the city's role. I will not say which model is the best, of course. There are some good points and some bad points in every model, and each city needs to find its own model with its citizens. But there is a trend line uh, running through these different patterns. It's the growing role of data visualization, because data visualization can be a medium, it can be a lever to fill this gap between uh, data and citizens. It's a way to interest citizens uh, in data, to popularize the open data, but it's also a tool for citizens to collect and to visualize their own data. And it's, and it's also a way for citizens to realize how important their data are uh, for their and for their city. Thank you.